you, many of you know Paul from uh, the extraordinary 2015 book Post Capitalism. Um, but he is also a journalist, broadcaster, documentary maker, um, writer of many books, journal pieces, commentary pieces, um, articles, um, plays as well. Yeah. Um, so he has a wide sort of reach, um, and he's uh, really probing. I know he's got a new book that he might want to talk about as well on um, humanism. Um, but I thought we would start with, I saw a piece you wrote, I think it was this week or last week, um, on neoliberalism. Yeah. And so I just want maybe just to sort of offer a few comments about what you understand neoliberalism to be or what you think people understand it to be. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so it's, quite, it, it's a critical issue, this, because, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn went to Brussels three weeks ago and did a, a speech of which the opening words were neoliberalism is broken and that happens to be more or less a precy of the first sentence of my book which you know I'm very happy to take ownership of um, but what I mean by neoliberalism is uh, is, the, is a whole system so not an ideology I mean in the sense that I'm talking about an objective system, I'm talking about a global system, and in this sense I don't care whether you want to call it anything else, you can give it a, the name of your pet tortoise, it doesn't matter, uh, because I'm not talking about the specific, uh, the specific ideology itself. But even so, what is amazing, before I go on, you know, is how few people, even if I say let's describe it as a, as an, as, as a thing, as an objective whole uh, could really define it and we did this exercise at uh, momentum at this fringe conference for a labor party conference in this big dance hall which was squatted it was quite a romantic kind of thing full of people and we asked the people to put their hands up if they thought they knew what neoliberalism was and out of about 300 people three put their hand up so what I was wondering is since this has been built as a seminar yeah. is whether or not let, let's do it this way Put your hand up if you think you could give a two or three sentence definition of the way slavery worked in the southern United States before the Civil War. Do you if, you, if you think you could explain how a surplus is extracted from slaves in the American... Not many, yeah? Come on. It, yeah, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to embarrass you. <laughs> okay. Okay, if I say to you, the Keynesian era, how many can could give me a two or three sentence description of what... The Keynesian economy was, let's say, or you might call the post-war British or an American French economy. You could, a few more, I hope. Nuffield College, thank you. <laughs> Go on. Okay, and then put your hand up if you think you could describe neoliberalism to me. So more, that's not bad. That's okay. So I think, what do you think neoliberalism is? Do you think it's a valid term? Well, I would start with sort of neoclassical economics, the revolution yeah. in economic thinking that separated from classical sorry, sorry. separated from classical political economy and then yeah. developments you know blah 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 this is your conversation though so maybe yeah. no, you I'm, would set out what you understand. All right but so so for me it's yeah, and I, I really this is the first thing we have to get over. The right in, in economics, above all this sort of ultra neoclassical right, always want definitions. And thinkers and uh, sort of would-be thinkers from my political neck of the woods are not that keen on definitions because definitions never capture movement. And they also all, almost never capture totality. Uh, Will Davis, who teaches at uh, Goldsmiths, who's a political economist, gives a brilliant, succinct definition. Uh, and I'm not alone, by the way, in, uh, uh, in being among those who have moved the term neoliberalism to the objective rather than to the, to the subjective um, ideology side of things. Davis says it is the disenchantment of politics by economics. And I think that's a, that's a pretty, you know, if, that's, if you want a definition, I would give that. But, but it, for the world, a better thing to do is to describe the beginning, middle and end of, of, of the phenomenon. And for me, it's the, it's the free market revolution of the, of the 1980s, beginning with Thatcher and the uh, Volcker uh, shock uh, in America. This creates a kind of national-centric North, um, global North-centric project 
of, you know, of uh, recapturing the ability to generate wealth out of industries uh, and, and structures and business models that were dying. Um, but after 89, I would argue the neoliberal system is born because you then get uh, the great doubling of the workforce within 10, 15 years. So double the number of workers to capital uh, because not only because you get globalization as well as getting uh, the the entry of of uh, the post communist countries into the world market, and it begins to function in a way that was best captured as it fell apart between two thousand and four and two thousand and eight. That is, it creates global imbalances between producing countries and consuming countries, borrowing countries and lending countries. It creates a a massive financialization of wealth in which the pipes, this is how Pisani and Brenda put it, who wrote a book in 2010, the two French bank economists, the pipe work that moves this, this imbalanced growth and imbalanced consumption around the world is not just doesn't work, it's unworkable and must create boom and bust. And boom and bust takes down uh, the system uh, in two, well, three ways. You know, the, the Asian financial crisis, uh, you, they kind of take their bat and ball home after that, the Asian countries, and start building up surpluses, which, which really then build up an, a surplus amount of money in the, in the economy that has to swirl around it. Pisani and Brenda say, see, in 2004, five, people like me, Martin Wolf, were all banging on about the, the imbalances. And the orthodox theorists of, of, of economics were saying to us, it's all right, it, it can be smoothed out. Pisani and Brenda say the only thing that could have stopped the endless accumulation of imbalance in the world was the 2008 financial crisis. And so for me, if I describe that neoliberal system as the whole thing, China, Germany, Japan, all the so-called mercantilist countries, as well as America, Britain, uh, Australia, etc. As a whole system, then it no longer worked after 2008. And, it, and insofar as it works again, it's, it generates the same problem, which is now what we're seeing now. There's another bubble. Uh, we maybe talk about what, where that goes. So that's my definition. Or insofar as a, my definition is a description of a, of a, of a, of a process of becoming and, 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 and ending. And for me, the, and I think there's support for this in the recent comments of central bankers. Uh, so Mark Carney in Shanghai, Claudio Borio of the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, I think all Andy Haldane as well, uh, chief economist of the bank, would, are all basically saying the same thing, but they don't say it as loud and, and as rudely as I say, in the sense that this thing is on life support. It's just on a $15 trillion worth of uh, balance sheet expansion by central banks, massive soft loans in the Chinese system, uh, zero interest rates across the world. That is life support. And uh, Sh the Shanghai speeches are worth reading, actually, because, because Carney basically says we can keep it on life support a long time, a really long time. And in fact, if, it, if the patient gets worse, we just pump more money in. We could give everybody 10 grand was the, was the kind of, you know, was the signal, uh, you know, we'll drop it into your account overnight. We, but, but says Carney, we can't cure the patient. You have to cure it, the politicians. Uh, and so my contribution to this debate is to say, cu curing it means moving on from it. And we have to invent a new kind of capitalism that is more attuned to, to the ruins, as it were. And your thesis in post-capitalism is yeah. that we are in transition, where the technological 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 change mm. is forcing the pace where capitalism, we we know it, can't sustain itself. Well, right? Yeah, the, but there are two processes going on, and, and in the book I make this clear that I believe there is a long term uh, there is a long term problem for capitalism. Full stop, it, because because. Information technology is different. Uh, this is what Paul Romer says in his famous, uh, you know, there was that joke, wasn't there? Uh, when, when Ned Balls mentioned endogenous technological change, that's Romer's, that's the title of Romer's paper, and everybody took the mickey out of him. But, um, but it's actually one of the most beautiful and brilliant economics papers, I think, uh, of our lifetime, because it just explains that, uh, that, that information technology goods 
cannot be monetized. They're just very difficult to own, very difficult, very difficult to create prices around. Uh, and what this does is it it creates, as well as what I just described, which is a kind of cyclical problem for a economic model. I mean, we both lived through the decline of the Keynesian model. It happens. Models end. Uh, Regimes, if you want to use the, accumula- uh, the, the, the regulationist uh, mm-hmm. terminology, which I don't, but regimes of accumulation end. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but this is more than regime of accumulation ending, because as well as this cyclical problem, and you know, the, the way I describe it to sort of lay people is it's a societal business model that has run out of steam. But as well as that, you've got the problem of technology's impact, which for me opens the possibility of rapid automation, rapid delinking of work from wages, um, the rapid emergence of business models and institutional models not based on uh, hierarchy, managerialism and profit. This is all a sort of 50-year thing for me. But what I said, in, and, and again, I'm not the first or only person to describe this. Uh, Rifkin describes it, Jeremy Rifkin describes it, uh, Alex Cernicek and, and uh, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams in their book on post-capitalism describe the same thing. But I'm the one who said the 2008 crisis was, a, was to use Keynes's words, it Money, money is a signal from the future. Money is signalling to us that the future isn't, isn't, doesn't necessarily look the same way as our investment decisions have, uh, have predicted it. Because it, you know, if we think even now, but if you just to kind of skip to now, the, the market cap of Apple is close to a trillion dollars. Now, just re- remember that market capitalization, that share prices are. A, a, a message to the future, which is the future is going to deliver uh, something like that trillion times twelve to twenty, uh, you know, back as as, pro, as, as earnings to, to the investors. Now, for it to do that, Apple has to be coming up with some spectacularly new needs for us to for, to you know we, we need more than a laptop and a and a cell phone to to deliver that trillion. Or it has to kill another company. It has, to, it has to destroy Facebook, Google, or Amazon, or Alibaba. Good luck with that, because it's behind an economic firewall. Uh, Alibaba's China's biggest tech company. So, you know, the, the market caps of these companies are a promise that can't be delivered because of what I argue about the, the, about the specific impact of IT. But I don't say that the 2008 crisis was like you know, the crisis of post-capitalism. And my political project... Well, we know, are in transition too. Well, I, I, I'd say only in the same... I, I, the, there's a whole chapter in the book where I talk about Shakespeare, about the history plays. Because I'd say, look, if you start with the first... If you put them in chronological order, start with the first one, last with, end with the last one, that's that's the transition from feudalism to mercantile capital uh, described, and and it's re- and you know I do this kind of spoof interview with Shakespeare saying you know what's the play about? What are these plays about, Mr. Shakespeare? And and he's, he says things like um, in my mind, you know, in my imaginary conversation with him, you know, it, it's about money seems to have invaded feudalism. Of course, he couldn't have had the word feudalism. The feudalism, feudalism as a term didn't exist. But money has invaded the kingly system, and it seems to be destroying it and creating some new morals. Now, in that sense, I think I, information technology has begun to do exactly this to a 200-year-old uh, capitalism based on scarcity. And you, you do get the emergence of new behaviours, new attempts to mix market and non-market behaviour, um, but only in that sense. So it's not the kind of transition that 20th century Marxism talked about. Yeah. In fact, I don't believe there can be a purposive transition in the same way that you know Marxism believes, you know, dictation for the proletariat. Well, it's just bring Corbyn in now. They're going to talk about yeah. 20th century Marxism. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, you see him as an antidote to, to this and, and anticipating... Well, look, you, you're a politician, and I'm, I'm a journalist who is now very active in politics. You can only work with the material that is around you. You know, uh, Stuart, if Stuart were here, I'm sure he would be, if Lord Wood were here, he, we'd be talking about Ed Miliband, uh, the people around him. You can only work with the people. I remember doorstepping you on the day that you launched your policy review under Ed Miliband, and there wasn't much to, there wasn't much well, that, well. You, that, you'd, that you'd been allowed to say. In other words, we have to work with the people that, that are presented to us by history. But So I, you know, I come from a very different intellectual background to, to Corbyn. I think that the reason I supported him is because I, I thought that the first base for saving some 
social democracy and turning things around would be to get somebody who said, it, we're not going to try and make the old system work. We're going to signal our intention to create a different kind of capitalism. Because to be clear, that if I think you know, a post-capitalist society is possible in, say, in, say the, the back half of this century, then I must therefore accept that the next task is to create a survivable form of capitalism. Um, and, and that's what social democracy uh, and its allies, its pro the progressive parties that we're going to have to work with, have to do. Um, because this, what, what the, we could get onto the diagnosis of the current system, the current problems. We, you know, we read the headlines. You, you, there's got what, one of the contingent proofs of what I'm saying. I think is there's got to be something more than corruption and incompetence behind the failures of traditional centre rightism. Because remember, the fact that all these centre right parties are winning elections doesn't mean the same people and same ideologies and same project is winning the election. And and look at the way not just that you know Trump has flipped the GOP over to what I would call nationalist neoliberalism, nationalist free market economics. Uh, I even think this is happening now in the CSU. If you go to Bavaria and, and, and see what people inside the CSU are saying to Merkel, it is, you know, big mistake over the migrants, um, ultra free market economics, but no national focused uh, politics and geopolitics. Um, and we were that far away from Fion uh, getting the nomination and Fion would have, I think Fion is, is in this sense a national and the, neoliberal. And so presumably one of your criticisms of present domestic political scene is there is no nationalist neoliberal party or ownership well, on the I right think, here. Is that what uh, well, I think the, what they can't, well, the, the, this is the problem. The, it's, the logic of the situation, which they have created themselves, should be that a hard Brexiteer neoliberal nationalism emerges. Right. Because then that's what it's like. This is the, you know, what wants to be born, as far as I can see. Mog, the reason this kind of, you know, very unusual politician, Jason, J Jacob Reese Mogg, remembering we're on camera, uh, I've gone no further in describing him as that, is it, it, seen as a, a viable leadership candidate. And I would argue the reason Preeti Patel thought that she was a viable leadership candidate is because they're the people who are really prepared to say, Trump, we love him, in the background, as is Boris Johnson. Now, the problem is, the British ruling elite is, I would argue, and I think if there's anybody studying this, I'd love to hear what you think. You know, the, the sociological study of city versus industry, which goes back to our time at university, has become obviously some much more complicated. But, you know, I see, um, through my interactions with the city, law firms, uh, th that kind of consultancy and accountancy elite, they're, they're basically intermediaries for... for hot foreign money, not always criminal foreign money, but m foreign money from highly accumulative uh, uh, sort of unusual capitalisms. Uh, but if you want to know what does the British ruling class think, uh, you have to then ask, what does the boss of BMW here, what's the UK general manager of BMW, what does the UK general manager of Raytheon, what are uh, Babcock and Brown, what do they want? And you know what they all want is stay in effing Europe is what they want us to do. And so the Tory party has managed to completely detach itself, I would argue, from the functional business elite that runs Britain, and it's attached itself to the kind of Crispin days of this world, uh, the, the, the sort of, you know, the, the ideologically committed nationalist neoliberals. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an inner um, problem for them, which cascades over to all free market uh, ideologies, I would argue, and that is, you, the, how do you do globalisation in a world where the number one country that invented it um, and benefited from it and continually shaped it and continually set the agenda for what it was, if you bear in mind that it's like a bike, if you stop riding it, you fall over. No, no, globalisation, not neoliberalism, globalisation as a process is a process or it's nothing. That the country that kept that process going has just voted to stop. Um, so, what what is the project of a British national neoliberalism? And the, the way this presents itself is in the whole trade treaty thing. We're going to have a trade treaty with America. Well, yeah, good luck. We've just put two hundred and eighty percent. Don't quote me on that's two hundred and something, isn't it? Uh, tariff on Bombardier produced wings uh, from Britain. 
And moving more specifically to the future of the left. Uh, like yeah, let me say, because I, I swerved away from Corbyn. I don't want to swerve away from the Corbyn thing. Well, I was going to try yeah, and bring you straight let's, there. Let's, yeah. go, let's bring it. Let, yeah. right. So the future of the left, what? what? What do we need to... Right. What? Well, I mean... Right. Corbyn, plus and minus. Okay, strengths, weaknesses, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the strengths. Absolute preparedness to ditch neoliberalism. And preparedness to listen to the fact that if you're going to do that, then some of the things you do actually do look like Keynesian uh, era state intervention, but the determination to ask expert people how you do that. Uh, because all governments that want to do that, except China, have a problem of how you... In fact, even the Chinese, I would argue, don't necessarily do it very well. Um, but they're... So, the plus sides break with neoliberalism, look for an alternative, understand and take the, as it were, reputational hit that some of it looks like nationalisation, uh, picking winners, state intervention, etc. Do that, but then at the same time, re retain an openness. And it's been an openness that is that's, it's quite difficult for the general public to pick it up when the media can't see it and, and, and filter it. Openness to what? To that part of the agenda that says, some of this is going to have to be done in a different way, from the bottom up, small scale. Uh, so the conference before last, MacDonald promised that Labour would double the size of the cooperative, uh, uh, the cooperative part of the UK economy, which is tiny, still doubling it gets you nowhere. Um, if you then think that they've promised to do a state investment bank and that the format of that is still open, so I would argue for lenders bank type uh, approach, you know, uh, and that's still open. Uh, so, so they may do regional investment banks. Uh, so you get borrowing, regional investment bank, cooperative, and then uh, citizens' basic income trial. And then on top of that, you've got this IPPR thing, which came out of left field because it wasn't a Labour initiative, but it's something that in my book I had proposed, which is citizens' basic services. So you've now got an emerging agenda that says, plug the gap with state intervention of an intelligent type. So you, so yeah. you, see, you see Corbyn as a much more agile, curious, and I mean that... Well, you know, I'd see intellectually I'd curious say, well, figure well, than as other a person, people. Than I, I've only ever met him four times, and and one of them was under the extreme sort of you know it, during the last summer when we were just trying to defend him. You know, the right. summer before last. Yeah. But so I don't have huge dealings with Corbyn. But as far as I can see, he is open and is a learning organism, as it were. Yeah. And the the the. McDonald, who I, you know, I've sort of I would be much closer to as a thinker over the years. I think has a team of people who are prepared to listen to that. So now, you know, uh, to mention another university, Mar Mariana Mazzucato has opened this big uh, state intervention, you know, industrial policy institute. I think it's either Kings or UCL. Anyway, so she, she's there. She's just been profiled in the Telegraph. It's quite a decent wedge of money they've got for it. You know, where's that going to go? You do, if you're going to um, pioneer an industrial policy for the 21st century, the, there's one party that we can absolutely be clear is not going to implement it, and that's the British Conservative Party. So where, who's the client for this multi-million project for? For Brazil-style investment, but it's a very interesting. I mean, so it's labour, you know. It is very interesting that you see Corbyn very differently to a lot of other people in the sense of you don't see him take the um, the manifesto, yeah, widely um, uh, laundered plaudits, yeah, all, all across the front for the manifesto, married sort of policy. Yeah. Radicalism with populist yeah. instincts, etc. Others would see it as a, a fairly orthodox early eighties left agenda right. that has reappeared. Um, so, so, right. So, on the fiscal side of the manifesto, the, the forty nine billion uh, tax, uh, tax and spend uh, pro, pro, project, um, I'd support that. Um, I think it was it could have been even clearer. I wanted them to do, you know, the equivalent of. Your kid goes to university. Google, Facebook, and Amazon will pay for it. I wanted to. to I, I would have been far happier if there has been a spreadsheet that was absolutely linked uh, to tax raising measures and tax spending measures. Uh, the bigger demand, the bigger project, the bigger issue is the is the National Investment Bank, which is you know, given that they you, nobody has landed a punch on Labour over its fiscal uh, on its fiscal credibility rule. And, and I was one of the people who 
you know, early on pushed them to do that, um, to vote against the government's rule, to have their own rule, because it then allows you to borrow over the life of a parliament, 250 billion. Uh, the OBR will have to get used to measuring the growth effects of that, which they don't, don't currently do. Uh, if the Treasury is measuring it, as the Treasury will have to, because the Chancellor will be saying to them they need to, uh, then the OBR will have to measure uh, in the same way. Um, and the two, I would have liked the 250 billion to have been the thing, because as you know, I, I'll, I'll be interested to know it played in your constituency, but I campaigned in three places where Labour lost, but are all very similar to your constituency. Uh, Plymouth North, Bolton West, and um, Anna, Tur Anna, Anna Subri's uh, seat in near, near Nottingham. Yeah, yeah. And the same problem, there was a lot of problems for Labour, but the, what you wanted to be able to do was have a much more concretised programme saying, we're going to come here, that school will get an extra class, this road will be built, this community centre will open up, this uh, mental health centre, this rape crisis centre, all the things that are closing, the police station will open, and here's how. Now, because it was a snap election, they didn't even try to concretise that. So they were left with a fairly abstract series of, of yeah, tax and spend measures. Uh, but obviously there's an argument over... See, the the counter-argument yeah, is yeah. that the manifesto was a bit of a rerun of something we've seen fairly clearly in the early ages from the left. And it sort of gutted a lot of the ideas around constitutional political reform were removed from well, could have yeah, been a much yeah. more interesting it, it, well, manifesto. It, it was too long. It was too long. Uh, I thought it was too long. And it was... It was only as short as it was because I think people think discussions were had with people who were trying to little, stack it with every possible, uh, you know, everything's costed. But the problem is, is some things you can do for free. But the problem is, you end up cluttering your your agenda. What people uh, we, we may be, we may be talking about this problem of the you know the traditional working class. I don't use the word white working class because I think it's a category framing thing that, that is not, doesn't exist. Uh, but but in those constituencies where Labour didn't win, and its problem is it needs to win 50, 60 of those type of places, um, you needed a front foot that was different. Uh, and I think that the front foot, we talk about maybe security and defence, which as you may know, I'm, I'm the sort of bete noir of the left over that. But you support Trident. I support Trident, I support expanding the Navy, I support um, all sorts of things. Uh, but... Well, let's come to that. Because well, let's, let's talk about the yeah. question of the, the, the base of the left. Because yeah, the, yeah. your, your post-capitalist thesis, one of the criticisms of it is it goes all in with the urban educated network youth being the new base of the left at the expense of its class composition, historically yeah. put. And that gets you into some interesting arguments about doesn't that precisely take you in the wrong direction that Labour needs to go now? because of the hemorrhaging of its class composition okay. electorally. Right. Yeah, well, let, let's step back, but let's, let's do this in, 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 in stages, because I think it's an interesting thing, and it's something I've been writing about since the Scottish referendum, uh, which I covered. So I thought that, you know, the long term, the, 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 the existential problem of, of social democracy is, is the decline of class voting patterns. And that's something that hopefully people here discuss. And it's not something to do with Ed Miliband or Neil Kinnock. It's just, it's just a decline of class voting patterns as working class life or life for people who work becomes more, uh, there's more formal logic, there's more ideas. I know that in the book I write about my grandmother's class consciousness. And it was just completely un. Uh, unlodged, un un unformalized at all. It was a series of folkloric gestures in her life, but it was bloody strong. You know, to be a miner's wife during the 1921 strike and then the 1926 general strike, to starve, to work in a munitions factory, to uh, all sorts of things, you know, my, my grandma went through. It's just, ba and her husband, my, my granddad, both born in 1900. I, I, growing up around them, you had an absolute understanding of what class consciousness is and where it comes from. Now, my dad, who was a truck driver, uh, had been a miner. Now, he was literate and he uh, could read music better than he could read English. But, no, no, he, when I came home with my Trotskyist newspaper, age 18, calling for a workers' government in 1979, he said to me, there'll never be a workers' government. And then he came up with this argument that was almost a direct um, lift from effectively what you might call um, 
Benite, the, the Benite theorists who've been teaching me at university. That is, the level of political consciousness between him and his lorry driver mates, this is just before the winter of discontent, was, was mapped very strongly onto Labour left theory about reform and revolution. So, so Ralph Milibandism. Okay. Now, his class consciousness was, in other words, negotiable. If somebody could demonstrate to him, and I mean, they never did demonstrate to him that free market economics would work, he would have. I think logically drawn the conclusion, as, as did so many people around us in those working class constituencies. Thatcher's victory, remember, in seventy nine was the was a whole it's sociologically uh, Essex man at that point was Midlands engineer, trade union member, Midlands engineering worker, switched to the Tories. Um, now that's phase two. Phase three is thirty years of being uh, destroyed, humiliated, atomized. I've, for my next book, I've inter interviewed a lot of my people who went to a primary school with uh, in Lee. And it's, to them, the world has changed as if it's a different planet. And they lament it. They've had to survive it. The, 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 these pla places where we're utterly um, socially coherent in, 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 within living memory. So I'm 57. My, my, one of my best mates lived, was a miner. I've interviewed him. He, you know, he says... We're surrounded by organised criminals. All there is around us is chaos, crime, poverty. Lee, where I come from, uh, Andy Burnham's old constituency, you know, Joe Platt for Labour, uh, has 50,000 inhabitants and 10,000 cases of domestic violence per year. So, uh, no, no, that's not 10,000 people. That's 10,000 events. But it is a different world to what they grew up in. Now, what, no, so that's... That's the basis. Now, I know you and, and the Blue Labour people uh, who you've been historically associated with have a particular view of how we deal with that, and I do. But that, can we agree that that's the problem? Yeah. 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 But you would, you would take it further. You would say, this is where your, the technology thesis kicks in. Yeah. It's, that, that it's not just that there's that um, hopelessness yeah. amongst that world's working class people. They're literally being destroyed through automation anyway. So you can almost, that you get to a conclusion I would suggest that mm. you say, well, leave them anyway, because the future, the well, future demographic, the profile of the people who have history on their side, who are more susceptible to Corbynism. Yeah. So I don't say, I certainly anyway. would never say leave them. Uh, what, but remember that there's a prior, his, there's a prior uh, theoretical argument that I have in the post-capitalism book, and that is against Marxism. Now, every time I go on the radio, some producer whispers in my ear, well, is it all right if we call you a Marxist? And I always say, as long as you mention Gramsci at the same time, and then they usually shut up. But um, it's, I, I, I think Marx, from the get-go, gets the problem of working-class agency wrong. That is, he gets absolutely right that it's a, it's a force that fights capital and will fight it to the death under some circumstance. But the, the idea that the, the, the philosophical category, that it, that, it, that, it tr that, you know, in Terminator, when you look through Terminator's eyes, there's all these attributes that you see, man, age 25. You know, I think Marx looks through his Terminator glasses and sees the proletariat having this invisible category called destroys private property. And it just, just doesn't. Um, and you could perfectly well support and have the same tactics in every great working class struggle, including the Russian Revolution, without believing that. Because, like I believe, and I'm strongly influenced here by my actual experience uh, growing up, that what the majority of working class people I've ever met wanted was to have greater space and control within capitalism. That is, in other words, the, the thing that they, you know, Marx uses this word, trag, to, Tragen, to, 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 the thing that they are carrying, dragging, bearing along with them in history is something, but it's a tendency to create, create uh, space in the jungle, to create control. And so I think that was always the case. That was true for my dad, granddads and previous generations. So I'm not saying it's this generation. I just think Marxism with its idea that the working class is the, is the agent of overthrow of capitalism is just, was just wrong. But what, um, and what, what is now happening is a kind of sublation process whereby a new workforce and consumer force is being created um, that is, in general, has a higher level of, of, of social capital, has a higher level of human capital, is more educated, etc. And uh, the people left behind have become a, a part of a tribal alliance 
that Labour has to hold together. And they might actually be, in some, in some, in some periods, the key tribe of the alliance. But they are, you can't, it, you can't you can't say it's this hegemonic force with a load of sort of appendages hanging off it. It just physically, I, I, I haven't been to your constituency here for a while, but everyone where I went, it was, you know, you could see the tribes. You could see the almost street by street. Here's where the Salariat lives. Here's where people who are just really living a very hopeless life and, need, and are just clients of social services live. And then in between, there's this struggling to decent working class, often very old, elderly, because people move out of these places. Uh, people move out of small towns full stop. They, we have a lot of things to offer them, and I think we've got to be, they've got to be a key part of the labour movement. And, it, and one of my problems with I don't know, like Corbynism, but the, the current configuration of, of Labour's politics is that it, does, it didn't have enough to say to them to slam dunk them back into the Labour fold. And now, more, more generally, you are seen as an advocate of the Progressive Alliance, a, a, yeah. a wider coalition of political yeah. forces over and above Labour, yeah. which is quite countercultural for a lot of the Labour left as well. Do you want to just... Yeah, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll, let's see, another thing is, you know, as a, as a former Trotskyist who's, you know, broken with all Leninism and things like that... Workers' but, power. Yeah, I was in workers' power, but workers' power was a tendency in the Labour Party, so... Um, you know, I, I think if you want to dig out their old stuff, they, a lot of it was non-mad. You know, I think uh, we tried not to be crazy, uh, but 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 uh, the, look the, within the forces that are attaching themselves to Corbynism, because one of the interesting things is no Trotskyist groups have actually joined Labour. Um, I would argue There's the, the, the ones, the, one of the smaller ones, have been like repressed, like Workers' Liberty, the workers liberty but yeah. the other the SWP, Counterfire. Etc. None of them really want to join. Uh, the the old militant tendency wants to join as long as it's allowed ridiculous amounts of uh, factional rights. Um, it's the, what's the result that I'm meeting twenty year olds carrying around uh, you know the, the works of J V Stalin. Yeah. Um, and no, this is nothing to do with Jeremy. It's nothing to do with um, with with uh, Seamus Milne, etc. It's the cultural thing in universities. You may even find it here. Um, they don't really mean J V Stalin. What they mean is it, it's a new leftism and in fact Ken McLeod the sci-fi writer once predicted that, w that when the generation when the generation had passed uh, that remembered Stalinism it would come back uh, so I'm not very happy with that number one okay number two you, so you, you say well you know post progressive alliance okay uh, what a modern Stalinist should be into you know modern classic communist party strategies would be the progressive alliance not you know kind of weird sectarian revivals of Stalinism. And, and I think that the Progressive Alliance is just one format of a more general answer that social democratic parties have to deploy. Because while we're worrying about the working class, it, the fact is that the Salariat, because it's the Salariat, uh, if you want to call it that, you know, the Salariat, the lower middle class, the, the networked individuals who I write about, in, and you know, Barry Wellman invented the term, and Castells, uh, is, is the, uh, to me, the, the version of the networked individual theory that I buy is his. Okay, they, they're really promiscuous in terms of politics. And they have, the, their world is centred, your world, it's your generation, is centred on the expanded footprint of the individual, weak organisational ties, mercuriality, uh, constant ability to learn and then drop skills, l uh, acquire and drop identities. They... Uh, quite good at flipping from one political project to another. And wherever they happen to be at the moment that you want to, to um, scoop them up into a, a society-wide alliance for progressive politics, you have to accept. And so there are still a million people who voted green. Uh, uh, I think they got less than a million this time. But, yes, uh, exactly. but, yeah. but we were working on a million, and, and I think uh, it's fair to say most of that difference went to Labour. Yeah. Um, I think there are still good people in Lib Dems, and, but above all, people will know, uh, well, there, there are, you know, there are people who share the industrial strategy of, of, that a Labour government would have. You know, Vince Cable, I think, would not be far from what the industrial strategy that, that Rebecca, uh, that, um, that, uh, that Labour, Labour's beast team would be doing. So, but then the other progressive nationalism, and I think that, uh, having covered the Scottish referendum, I became convinced that, that, 
Scotland being independent within 50 years, uh, no, that's a long time to most of us, but in history, it's not that long a time because 16 year olds are really for it. 16, 17, 18 year olds really for it. They see the cultural nationalism as embodying the, what they like, the, the thing that they phone in themselves by being a kind of network progressive individual. It's very mapped on, you know, so I'd meet like young Rangers supporters who say, I support in independence, but it goes against my team. What they meant is I support independence, but it goes against the sectarian reactionary bigoted orange order that's sitting in the corner of the local working men's clubs. They, it had, nationalism, Scottish nationalism had broken the most unlikely people away from their traditional uh, uh, culture. And I think that, therefore, it, for Labour, to, if, if Labour came to power in a snap election in a month's time and, say, had 10, 15 seat majority, I think, uh, and even bigger, but, it, you know, definitely even if it had a kind of 10, 15, 20 seat majority, I would argue that what it should then do is proactively approach the, the, the SNP implied, and if the Greens get two or three MPs, them as well, and create a coalition government because then you've got the weight and the momentum uh, for doing social change. And it would also anchor um, Labour then into, you know, into avoiding needless tactical conflicts. So, you know, I think, what would I do? You'd have to give up fracking. You know, parts of the GMB union very keen on fracking. I'm not so keen on it. Um, SM, the SNP had a big existential discussion where they nearly went for fracking because if they wanted to do the second referendum and get economic independence, some were saying, well, we've got to frack Scotland, but they actually rejected it. So I think I would, I would be very, very keen for the, the Green New Deal, for example. I'd hand it to uh, whoever was a Green, you know, if it was Caroline Lucas, I'd, I'd create that, you know. See, the interesting thing, this progressive alliance which you embrace, the, yeah. the democratic parts of momentum, I'll, I'll come to what I mean by that in a yeah. minute, because it seems to me, and why I asked the question about Corbyn actually, is because at the heart of this, there's quite a tension between very pluralistic, yeah. inclusive, very democratic sort of, what do they call it, horizontalist politics yeah. around yeah, yeah. the younger people who've been attracted with Corbyn, yeah. bolted on with a, a classically Leninist political organisation as well. And how do you marry okay. this up? And okay. how sustainable is this? I think the there's a third level? thing. Demographically, the Momentum's got, what, 32,000 members now. And I think I would be right in saying probably it's half and half. Young networked people who are, you know, more Negri, more intersectionality theorist, uh, you know, that's their politics, what they learn at university, fan honests, you know, uh, then uh, the people who I interviewed in my hometown who were all, it was momentum, it was a momentum group I got together and it was all working class men and women, uh, highly articulate, but their politics is Benism. Uh, because that's what they learned, that's what they thought was successful. Now, in that sense, already Corbynism is an alliance and you will know within the PLP, there's lots of people who, as it were, signed up, who are not ideologically massively different than your average centrist Labour MP. But to create a... Uh, I don't see the Leninist aspect of it there, weirdly. But, but, but you know, the weirdest thing is that you, 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 it's a minor footnote in political history, but it turned out to be quite interesting and, and, not, and not unimportant, is that over the New Year period, as you may remember, momentum dissolved and reconstituted itself all in, a, in a single hour uh, yeah. without people who would got themselves onto its um, leading committee who were not in the Labour Party. Um, this is a... That, that I would this say... This is symptomatic of the problem, though, Paul, yeah. isn't it? This is, this is the tension at the heart Well, of it, it was created... I mean, remember, it was created as a left... Uh, you know, at the time, when, when they created it, the idea was, uh, well, you know, uh, we want a movement inside and outside the party. That was always what the left used to say. Ben used to... Well, the march, new left used to talk about that. Yeah, the march. Union, one foot in, one foot out strategy. I, I was, I, you can Google a, an interview by me at the Socialist Conference 1985 or six in, in Chesterfield. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm quite young in it, a bit weird, bit, uh, a bit gabby. But, but what, that's what the Socialist Conference was. It was. And that's what Beyond the Fragments, in a way, the, the, although from a different, it was from the fragments out, upwards. There was these several attempts to create inside and outside Labour. Now, I think that's, that was the, that, that era of people, they always try and do this. But of course, what it became obvious that it would have to be a democratically constituted uh, uh, part of the Labour Party. And then the other thing they found, and I think it is the case, that 
some of the people that they were attracted to, what you what you cannot do is vet them because you you know there's three people sitting in in half a room of the of the TSSA's HQ at Euston Station trying to run momentum, and then people ringing up saying this bloke we found this person who you know there there have been people and not just uh, people who did who, who transgressed in, in an anti-Semitic way, but people who who the classic problems that you get in all public organisations have got criminal records for various things. And how can, you know, my argument with them, you can't police this. You've just got to become a moulded onto Labour pressure group that achieves things which is supporting Corbyn's politics, not a kind of mini separate thing. And the reason that coup took place, in, which it was a coup, I think, was to basically say, right, we're going to we're going to end any shenanigans by people coming in and, and abusing the, the brand.